Thomas More, a 16th century English representative of the Northern Renaissance, was uh, perhaps in, in the most full sense of the term, a Renaissance man. A Christian saint known for his outstanding piety and devotion and integrity, ultimately beheaded for his refusal to acknowledge Henry VIII's rule of the English Church. A member of, of Parliament, a diplomat, ambassador, and eventually Lord Chancellor of England. Moore was also a great man of learning. He was an elegant writer of Latin, a student of Greek prose, as well as classical Greek philosophy, and an important member of the circle of Northern Renaissance figures that seemed to center around Erasmus. And finally, of course, uh, and perhaps most importantly for the text we'll be looking at, Utopia, he was a man of great wit. Uh, a man of great jest. In fact, was known to all of his friends as a man with a profound sense of humor. And as we'll see, that becomes an important strategy of the utopia. Now, the utopia is most famous as a precursor to what we now call communism. And while I think that there is certainly some accuracy to that sort of view of the utopia, I think in a sense it, it it's too forward-looking. It fails to see the utopia in its own context. I would urge that Moore's utopia is the last great Christian synthesis, the last great attempt to take the wisdom of the ancient world, specifically of the Christian world, and synthesize it with the learning of classical Greece. Um, the most obvious source for utopia is clearly Plato and Plato's Republic, which the utopia is fairly closely modeled on. And you will remember, of course, from Professor Acuti's discussion as well as Professor Dalton's, that the Republic, in fact, enjoined the practice of communism. Okay, so if, if the Platonic uh, Republican tradition is the, the Greek aspect of the synthesis, what is the Christian aspect? I will urge that what it, in fact, is is Christ's gospel of love. The gospel of caring for the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden, the sort of moral wisdom that's reflected in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The last shall be first. Now, although that's certainly the official creed of Christian countries, it's a rather dangerous policy to actually preach publicly, particularly in a community where there is no such thing as freedom of speech, much less freedom of thought. In fact, we know that <clears throat> Moore is beheaded, not for anything he says, but in fact for something he thinks. So he, what Moore faces himself with, as it were, in writing the utopia, is a strategic problem. How to criticize contemporary social and political mores, the institutions that reign over society, without at the same time finding yourself drawn and quartered? Um, not an easy piece of business. It's the exact same problem, incidentally, that Socrates faced. Socrates' solution, we will remember, was irony. Whenever he would say something uh, to offend his interlocutors, make it meet a general and say, well, tell me about generalship and convince him that he knows nothing about what it is to be a general, he would at the end defend himself by saying, well, of course, I know nothing. I'm just as ignorant as you. And that sort of protected him for a while until people sort of got sick of the Pied Piper of Athens. Um, Moore's technique was comedy. What Moore did was write the utopia as a comic, almost silly, buffoon-like uh, jest. And, in, and it's very much like uh, the medieval tradition of the court fool or court jester. If you've read Lear or ever seen it, you'll know that the fool is the one person who's, because he's such a, a buffoon, a simpleton is allowed to speak the truth. And he's the only character who is. Well, so Moore does with Utopia. In fact, all of the names, Utopia is written in Latin, which is the universal language of the Renaissance. All of the proper names in Utopia are literally absurd. They're comical. Um, Utopia, for example, means no place, nowhere. Right, so where's Utopia? Nowhere. Uh, the Socratic hero, Raphael um, has a last name that means dispenser of nonsense or, disp or dispenser of stupidity, stupid talker. Um, the basic unit of political organization, which is a group of, I think, 30 households, is referred to as a sty. And therefore, the people who live in it are 
are pigs living in the pig sty, and they have a, a the local Burgess is known as a sty warden, or perhaps a swine herd. Um, and so, in this way of saying this is a simple jest, it's a joke, all of these are comic buffoon characters, he's able to actually almost esoterically tell his, his deeper uh, story. Also, it's a v work very rich in allusions. Uh, you'll notice the story of the styes is also an allusion to Plato's City of Swine, which is the first ideal city in speech that Socrates builds in the Repu Republic, in which justice takes care of itself. So it's, uh, as I say, not only a work of jest, but a work of allusion, and very much, I would urge, a subversive work. Comic buffoonery becomes the venue through which criticisms of the prevailing social and political orders are vented. Like the Republic, Utopia, <coughs> excuse me, Utopia takes the form of a dialogue <coughs> led by a Socratic wise man, in this case, the Portuguese Raphael. Again, like the Republic, the first book sets the stage for all that's to follow. Um, <coughs> And in fact, what is to follow in one book, book two, is an exposition of the communal, social, and political arrangements of the utopians that uh, Raphael claims he's observed in his travels through the New World. And here is where Moore injects the quote, realism in his travel log. He says, well, this fellow Raphael traveled with Emerigo Vespuccio in his travels around the world. And somewhere, presumably off the coast of Florida, he found this wonderful island called Utopia. So, in book one, Moore meets Raphael, the character. He's, uh, Moore is in the midst of ambassadorial duties for the English crown. He's in, I believe, Brussels at the time, and uh, they take a break from their conference, and for three days he travels to Antwerp to meet a good friend of his, Peter Giles. Now, he actually did go on this mission and actually did meet Peter Giles, who was part of the, uh, one of the collaborators behind the writing of Utopia. But as Utopia recounts it, or as, the, as book one recounts it, he meets Giles. Giles comes up to him and says, I've met the most remarkable guy. There's this fellow, and he, he points over to him, and he's seen everything in the world, truly philosophic mind, incredibly wise guy. And, you know, Moore looks at him, and he's, he's taken aback. Here is this guy with a, a long cloak and a sunburned face and a weather-beaten, you know, appearance. And so they strike up conversation. And Raphael tells him some of what he's learned in his travels, and of course, Moore is, is, is impressed. And he suggests that, you know, a man of your wisdom, you might do well to enter the service of some king. So the discussion turns to the political realm. Raphael thinks better of the suggestion. He points out that the sort of advice he has and the sort of ideas he has might not be very, how to put it, welcome at court. And he says, imagine. I go to the French court. The king is busy in deliberation. He wants to conquer Venice. On the way, maybe he'll get Tuscany too. Maybe Lombardy thrown in. Unfortunately, he doesn't have enough money to pay off his Swiss mercenaries, so he'll have to raise taxes. Fortunately, his country is so poor that they'll be unable to raise up in rebellion, so he wants to keep them poor by sitting on trade and commerce. That way, they'll never fight back at these horrible impositions of taxes. And Raphael points out, now, am I really going to be welcome when I turn to the French king and say, you know, the best thing you could do is forget about Venice and uh, Lombardy and Tuscany, and better yet, try to govern France well. You haven't done that yet. Um, and while you're at it, rather than raising taxes, why don't you lower them? I mean, a shepherd certainly considers himself a better shepherd if his sheep are fat rather than emaciated, right? I mean, why do you think they made you king in the first place? And as for poverty, what kind of an honor is it to live over a nation of scarecrows? And he says, well, Moore, you're a practical man. Do you think that's really what the King of France wants to hear? And Moore points out, well, well, I guess you're right in a way. But still, it would be good if, if the kings could get some sort of philosophic insight, even if it wasn't quite as, as radical as yours. He says, look, there's no shortage of philosophic insight. Kings can read the Republic. Kings can read all the works of the ancient world. They choose not to. Why sacrifice myself? And then he points out that whenever you go to a court, there's no honest discussion. There's nothing so much sycophancy, flattery, 
um, and sort of debasing discourse. And that's when the discussion turns to England. He says, even when I was in England, Moore, I heard such conversations in the court. And then Moore says, wow, you've been to England. Well, that's fantastic. I'm English. Uh, tell me all about it. So he tells the story, or Raphael does, of his visit to England at the court of Cardinal John Morton, who is incidentally one of Moore's patrons and a man Moore admired greatly. And no sooner do they sit down, in, or does he start recounting the story of this visit to the court, um, when he says that, I don't know how it started, but some, there was some lawyer there, right? And lawyers are always bad guys in Renaissance figure. Um, there was some lawyer there bragging about how great and wonderful the British laws against thievery are. Why, he says, we, we're hanging them left and right, 20 on a gallows consistently, and yet for some reason, there's still more of them out there. I mean, we find every one we can that could possibly be guilty, string them up, and there's more the next day. I can't account for it. And of course, that's the very powerful image that starts the actual substance of the utopia moving. That image of 20 people on a gallows. Not for rape, not for murder, right? not for poisoning, but for perhaps stealing bread, for perhaps taking firewood off the common lands, for perhaps gleaning extra crops. That's the image, 20 on a gallows. Clearly more is horrified. So Raphael, knowing that the good Cardinal Morton is an open-minded man, feels free to criticize these laws. He says, first of all, what's the cause of this crime? Certainly you know that executing these people will not stop it. The cause of crime is social, social dislocation. And there are two sorts of socially dislocated persons in England. There are the useless. And at this moment, when he mentions the useless, our ears are supposed to prick up and we're supposed to assume he's talking about poor people. But of course he says, no, I'm not talking about poor people. I'm talking about knights and soldiers and lords and people who've never worked a day in their life and who contribute nothing to society. Don't feed anyone, don't clothe anyone, don't write anything. All they do, sit around, get drunk, eat, uh, and fight. And when they come back from wars, disabled, there's nothing for them to do. Right? They, they're no longer going to be kept in, in service. So if you're a man who's trained in the military arts, you've never worked a day in your life, you think it's demeaning, and you've gotten the sack from your lord, what are you going to do? You're going to become a robber. Right? That, that's what you're trained for. So he says, that's the first thing you've got to deal with. Then the second problem are the useful people that are dislocated. And here he turns to the discussion of the enclosure movement. The enclosure movement was a movement in England where public lands and even feudal domains where peasants had traditionally raised crops were enclosed to create more forage land for sheep. And Moore is very particular about how the sheep, or Raphael I should say rather, how the sheep are eating the English peasants. And the reason was quite simple. The first capitalist industry was woolen textiles. And it developed in two countries, the Netherlands and then in England. Whoever could produce the most sheep and most wool, therefore, would be at the cutting edge of the capitalist revolution. And England, because of the enclosures, was. was the first na nation to industrialize and probably had the highest standard of living as a result. But it came at a horrific price. You took an overwhelmingly peasant society and literally threw the people off the land. They had no choice but to either become vagabonds, beggars, thieves, or congregate in the vastly overcrowded crime and disease infested cities where they would become a landless proletariat. And Moore stands at the onset of this process, which goes on for a, well over a hundred years after Moore dies, and critiques, it, critiques the birth of capitalism. And he says, you have useful people now that you've made useless, and those are peasants and tradesmen who can no longer subsist on the land. And finally, he points out, isn't it rather inane to have the death penalty for any crime of property? Consider, if it's the same penalty for me to take your wallet as it is for me to kill you, why shouldn't I get my money's worth and kill you while I'm at it? Surely that's barbaric, he says. And moreover, he says, let's be honest, is it any deterrent for a man who has to feed his family? If his kids are starving to death, he knows it's not right to steal. He doesn't care whether he's going to get killed for it. He's no choice. His back is up against the wall. That's Moore's point. 
Look at the causes. What produces this? And in fact, uh, this leads Raphael to comment on the gap between so-called Christian values and Christian behavior. Right? He says, if you read what's in the Bible, what's in the New Testament, it is nothing like what we do. So we've come up with a very simple solution. Since we can't get human behavior to follow Christian morality, we'll just rewrite the morality to fit the behavior. And he says, but of course, that's sacrilege. And that is, in fact, blasphemy. The solution to these problems, Raphael suggests, quite controversially, is the institution of communism. As he says, Though to tell you the truth, my dear Moore, I don't see how you can ever get any real justice or prosperity so long as there's private property and everything's judged in terms of money. Unless you consider it just for the worst sort of people to have the best living conditions, or unless you're to prepare to call a country prosperous in which all the wealth is owned by a tiny minority. And that's, I would argue, the, the Christian intuition behind Moore's critique. He would say, well, in our society, who is the problem in our society? W what is hurting our culture today? Who are the bad people? Are the bad people the homeless? Are the bad people the working poor? Or are the bad people the people who sell junk bonds? The people who market uh, automatic weapons? The people who create uh, financial scams? Which are really the morally bad people in our society? The poor or the very rich? His view is, if you accept what Jesus wrote, you have no choice in making that decision. It's quite simple. The rich are the problem that have enclosed the vast bulk of uh, the society's income. Well, Moore is incredulous at the suggestion. He says, you know, it's a beautiful idea, communism. I've, I've read about it some places, but, you know, it's got a problem. If you do away with private property, no one will have an incentive to work. Everyone will be lazy, and everyone will have a lousy standard of living. Right? Very sensible argument. And in fact, Raphael admits that it's sensible. He says, well, of course you're bound to say that. For the simple reason that you've never seen such a society, and therefore it's rational for you to be skeptical. But, he says, I have seen such a society, and that is utopia. And then that brings book one to a close. The purpose, then, of book two is to detail the actual workings of the utopian society. The first thing that strikes you is, or sh should strike the reader, is that it's extremely similar to England in its physical topography. It's an island separated from the mainland by a small channel that was dug. It's got 54 towns. I think there were 54 shires in England at the time. And it's got a centrally located uh, capital called Air Castle, which is roughly where London would be in England, with a large river running through it called No River, which would be the Thames. Um, so clearly, what we're supposed to glean from that, I think, is that this is not just a, quote, what we call utopian scheme. This is actually something which is possible and plausible, a, a legitimate form of Christian social reconstruction. Everything in utopia is owned by the community. There's no private property. All production is located in the household, with one exception, agriculture, right? Almost everyone lives in towns and engages in urban production, except for people who are brought out to farms on a two-year basis. So basically what happens is instead of being drafted for the army, you would be drafted to work on a farm at some point in your life for two years. And uh, they would rotate a new group every, every year. Okay. Trades are assigned to various persons on the basis of aptitude and choice. But again, it's done in the household. And this is an important thing to remember, that at least in, well into the 19th century, the household is the locus of all production. When you have, if you are a, a candle maker and you have a son who wants to be a tailor, you send him to the house of a tailor to grow up. Since that's where production will occur, he will be taught that art by that person. And similarly, we find that in the utopia. People are moved to different households depending on their, what sort of production they're going to engage in. Now, unwelcome tasks like, say, uh, extra work during harvest time, uh, butchering, uh, dirty sorts of labor, 
are reserved for slaves. And we'll talk about slaves before too long. Um, but the point is there are certain sorts of labor that they don't feel the average good utopian citizen should ever have to undergo. And I think the most significant is butchering. They feel that, more argues, that butchering animals inculcates cruelty and savagery in people. And therefore, uh, it's something which a gentle citizen should never engage in. Okay, now because almost every single person in Utopia works, you don't have to work very long. In fact, the work day lasts only six hours, and sometimes they don't even need that, and so they declare extra holidays. It's broken into two three-hour segments, in which there's a large meal in the middle. The point of working is to produce just enough so that we can have all of our basic necessities met, and then have as much leisure as possible. The point of utopian society, of this communal society, is to create as much leisure and cultural enrichment for the average person as is imaginable and feasible. Leisure is spent studying, studying music, studying philosophy, listening to my lectures perhaps, uh, gardening, again an allusion to England because the English were very keen on gardening and still are. Um, or perhaps attending lectures in science. Now, those who don't have these hobbies, and I should point out, they're all fairly highbrow cultural hobbies, um, are free to spend their time, their leisure time, working and producing more things. There's no problem with that whatsoever, and in fact, they're fairly well respected for it. What they're not allowed to do is loaf. One thing about Utopia, there's no privacy. You can't get away with anything. No houses have locks, right? None of the doors have locks. There's always two doors, so you can't hide anything at all. In fact, if you want to travel, you have to get a permit. And if you travel anywhere for more than 24 hours, you have to start working in that area. So at the end of a, of a hard day, everyone goes to bed at 8 o'clock, gets eight hours sleep, and then starts the next day. Meals are consumed in a public dining hall. You're allowed to eat at home, but no one would ever choose to. Uh, because the meals are delicious and are accompanied by light philosophical discussion, reading of, of edifying moral poetry, um, and uh, they are, uh, how to put it, the doling out of foods is done on a geront gerontocratic basis, which is to say, the young wait on the old. Okay. Now, as for the organization of the household itself, as I mentioned, it's the locus of production. It's also intensely patriarchal. Every month, uh, at the end of the lunar month, there is a period of confession in which children confess to their parents and wives confess to their husbands and um, all the other male, adult males in the household confess to the eldest male. And that way, they sort of purge all of the you know, little uh, grievances they had against each other. They also have an interesting custom of marriage inspections just to say, if you want to marry uh, a man or a woman, um, if I want to marry a woman, for instance, I let it be known, if we're both amenable, I am taken by a female chaperone in to inspect her naked. And then she has the opportunity to inspect me naked. And Raphael says that when he was in Utopia, he thought that was really funny, and he laughed at them. And the Utopians responded to him, and they said, well, it's funny, when you buy a horse, you look in its mouth, I mean, the thing's practically naked anyways, right? But you bother to take off its saddle and look for little sores, don't you? Now, you're going to spend a little more time with the missus than you are with that horse. Why, why would you make your judgment on the basis of about six square inches of exposed skin flesh? And, of course, that, that, the point here is that the utopians live not by convention, but by nature. It's that stoic ideal of natural virtue, not conventional mores. Um... That's not to suggest that they believe in sexual promiscuity. Adultery and fornication are punishable by slavery and, if repeated, by execution. Uh, as I've mentioned, the oldest male runs the house, and each household must have somewhere between 10 and 16 adults. These houses are publicly maintained uh, and uh, carefully uh, kept up so that they don't have to be rebuilt, and all clothing is produced within the home and is completely uniform. There are no dyes. So everybody wears leather with wool on top when they 
are going out and nothing has died. Finally, people switch houses every 10 years. And the reasoning there, I think, is quite straightforward. They don't want anyone to become attached to any possessions. The only thing you should be attached to is the community and to one another. Okay, now, the government. Every 30 households makes up a sty, as we said, and they elect a swineherd or sty ward. For every 10 sty wards, there is a bench eater or senior district councillor to make it a little more respectable, and all these offices are annual. But the sty wards, and there's 200 of them per town, elect the mayor of the town, who holds office for life. Unless, of course, he's ever convicted of a crime or an attempt to impose a tyranny, in which case he's deposed. There are several very interesting political arrangements that Moore suggests for, uh, or uh, claims to hear from Raphael about Utopia, but are clearly suggestions for England, where he'd been a member of parliament. The first, and I, I think perhaps the most compelling, is that you can never discuss a political issue outside of council or outside of chambers. I think the reasoning is pretty straightforward. As soon as you get to the cloakroom, you're going to start cutting party, party deals. So if you're forced to only discuss things on, say, the House floor or the Senate floor and committee chambers, um, you will never have a chance to offer anyone a deal and you'll only be able to make judgments on the basis of what seems to you to at least be best policy. Moreover, no legislation can be discussed the day it's introduced. He said the, the reason of this is they have this horrible feel that, feeling that if you introduce a piece of legislation and let people talk about it, they'll say the first thing that comes off into their heads because they love to hear themselves talk. And you want to have a very constructive dialogue. Therefore, you should force people to spend at least a few days thinking about the issue before they're allowed to, to comment. Now, the various towns elect delegates to a national parliament with an elected prince for life. That, that basic function is to allocate goods and labor to all of the individual 54 towns. And what they do is if there's a drought in one area, they have someone else produce, in another area, produce extra food, and they bring it down. Um, in addition to which, they also set foreign policy. Um, and create new colonies. An important thing they don't do is pass laws. Like in Plato's Republic, Moore acknowledges, if you have to pass laws, you don't have a very good society. The basic legal principle should be what was at the time known in English jurisprudence as equity. Right? Any man who is rational enough to be a good judge does not need to have written precedence. He can simply hear the case use his reason, his common sense, and a sense of compassion to figure out what ought to be done. So the more laws you create, all you do is create loopholes. So there are no laws in utopia. Property criminals, people who steal, are enslaved, um, as are prisoners of war and, uh, incidentally, foreign volunteers. Now that's a, an interesting question. Why would people volunteer to be slaves? Well, his point is that slaves don't actually work much harder than normal utopians. They may work instead of six hours, eight or ten hours a day. But considered to anyone else anywhere in the world who's working 14-hour days at the time and barely surviving, it's heaven to be a slave in utopia. Um, they don't ever whip you or beat you. They just keep you in, in uh, chains, all made of gold, right? Because gold is absolutely useless for anything except chaining people. Um, and, in fact, if you prove to be um, a good prisoner, one who truly regrets not just being caught, but what you did, uh, they will, of course, release you and allow you to become a useful member of society again. And, again, that's the utopian penology. Compare that to that powerful image we got at the beginning, 20 people on a gallows. Now, that's not to say the utopians are completely soft on crime, if you're a recalcitrant criminal or a violent criminal, they have no problem in executing you. Um, enough on jurisprudence. I want to now mention something about the governors of Utopia. For in many ways, again, this is almost identical to what we find in Plato's Republic. You remember in Plato's Republic, the best rulers are philosopher kings. In this case, the rulers are drawn from the educated from what uh, I might call the class of intellectuals. Entry into the class is purely meritocratic. It's done by testing, 
I guess they're equivalent of the SATs, and there is plenty of social mobility into the class. In other words, if one is a carpenter and at the age of 30 develops a strong propensity for materialist metaphysics or whatever, uh, one is more than able to join the, quote, thinking class. And of course, one can remain an intellectual uh, as long as one's high cultural work is up to snuff. So, some of those intellectuals uh, are teachers, some small section of them become edu uh, rulers, and another section of them, we will see, become priests. But again, the point is that, like Plato's Republic, we have a rule of reason in, in the aegis of the most reasonable person. However, unlike Plato's Re Republic, those people are elected by the common people, right? You can only elect a, a quote, intellectual to high office. But you, being an intellectual will not put you into high office. You must be elected. It is a democratic society. Okay, trade and commerce. Utopians engage in a lot of extensive trade. They really only want one thing from the outside world, iron. They don't have any, and they think it's the only useful metal. However, they do take uh, gold and silver. They have no use for them except to bind their slaves, but they find that there's a lot of other primitive peoples around them, like the English and French, who actually are impressed by shiny metal objects, or shiny metals, gold, uh, that have no actual use value. So they use them uh, for decorations at home, chamber pots, spittoons are all made of gold. Uh, jewelry is given to little children that grow up in the public nurseries until, of course, they get old enough to realize it's an embarrassment to carry around jewelry. It's a, ch a childish bauble. Its most important use, however, is in foreign policy. And the foreign and military policy of the utopians is, in many ways, uh, one of the most remarkable uh, features of their society. They only fight wars for three reasons. To defend their territory, to defend the territory of an ally, and to liberate oppressed peoples. They sign no treaties for the same reason they have no laws. If I have to sign a treaty with you, <laughs> then you're obviously not a very trustworthy person. And then what's the point of signing the treaty? Because you're only going to break it anyways. And if you are a trustworthy person, then I can trust your humanity and I don't have to sign a treaty with you. So they don't waste any time signing treaties. Um, their means of fighting wars is extremely devious and it has a, a high priority on saving, uh, saving life, particularly utopian life. As soon as war is declared, or they know that an enemy is going to declare war, they produce a large number of posters which they send spies into the enemy country to post. And the posters say, wanted, dead or alive, X amount of gold if you bring in the president of this country's head, double that amount if you bring him in alive. And they go through all the chief military officers, all the chief political officers, and everywhere in the enemy's land are these signs saying, bring us your leaders and we'll give you loads and loads of gold. And of course they do. They always honor those pledges, and that's a great way of ending a war very quickly. You just, you get the, the populace to round up uh, their leaders, and he says people do anything for gold, and you know, it's quite successful. If that doesn't work, perhaps the people are too intimidated, or it's a military dictatorship, um, they have no problem in buying off the army. Right? As the other army stands up, they say, look, gold over here. You want the gold? Sure, come, come to our side. And again, they, they really pay them. They, they don't cheat them or anything like that. Um, and then finally, if that doesn't work, they employ mercenaries. Um, and they pay them huge sums of money. In fact, uh, the group of mercenaries they use are called the Venalians and are clearly a reference to the Swiss, which were the great mercenaries of the time, uh, often portrayed as an extremely barbaric people. And uh, they have no qualms about using mercenaries and paying them large sums of money, and they tend to be very fond of sending them into suicide missions. Um, because they feel the more of the Venalians or Swiss you can kill off, the better for humanity, because these are people who like nothing more than bloodshed. No one is ever drafted to fight abroad. Uh, you, you can if you wish, but it's, it's, it's never required. But you must, however, always fight in defense of wars on your own territory. Women as well as men are trained, and women are not enjoined to stay home if their husbands go off to war. They are, if they choose, uh, allowed to join them at the front. At the secession of hostilities, they exact reparations, not according to the way of the Italian city-states from your allies, who now owe you, but rather from their enemies. Um, and in fact, they don't even take the reparations. They leave that to their allies because they're more than wealthy enough. They don't need very much. Um, and they give quarter to all non-combatants, 
and in fact give reward to all those who spoke out against the war against utopia. Now, <clears throat> the religious arrangements are perhaps uh, more remarkable still. And they're incredibly tolerant. Their religion is, and religious services are all ecumenical. Their cathedrals or churches are dark without any representations in them, no statuary, no stained glass, and they're very self-consciously thought out. They want darkness so that you do not become distracted and you become meditative and contemplative. They don't want any images because they realize each person represents God differently. And we should all be able to share our representation individually in one common space. Um, their prayers as well are ecumenical. Right? There are various different sects. One priest thinks the sun is God, another thinks the moon is God, another believes in Mithras. All of their prayers are applicable for any sect, and it would, would include all of our sects as well. Their priests, as I've mentioned previously, are scholars, renowned for their piety and religious devotion, and they are more than free to marry if they wish. They all fundamentally agree on the uh, point of monotheism and human immortality, and can join that with the notion of retribution and reward for good behavior in heaven and hell. Religious toleration in the society is a set policy. Even atheists, or materialists, as Moore calls them, are tolerated, though with one restriction. They're not allowed to speak publicly, to publicly defend their views, vote, or hold office. And the reason is fairly straightforward. If you don't believe there is a God who will punish you for evil actions, then the only reason you don't do evil actions is because you're afraid you're going to get caught in which case, why would we want you in high office? Or why would we even let you vote? On the other hand, um, they are encouraged privately to dispute with the priests because their atheism and materialism is not seen as a moral failing so much as a piece of ignorance on their part. And that if there is a free and open exchange of ideas, ultimately truth always wins out. The priests also uh, visit the public hospitals where the sick and infirmed are kept. And when they find diseased and bedridden people, so of which there is very little hope of recovery, they counsel them to practice euthanasia. They say, come now, you don't want to be a burden on your children and your society. You've lived a long and, and fulfilling life. Painlessly, we can take it from you. Now, if they choose to uh, accept euthanasia, they are, of course, honored and cremated. But if they don't, there's no stigma attached, and they are nursed and loved, as usual. Finally, one last religious arrangement, uh, Raphael tells them about Christianity. And, as you might su uh, suspect, they're crazy for it. They think it is terrific. And what really sells them for it is, when he tells them about the Beatitudes and the teaching of Christ, they say, this was the greatest philosopher of all time. Like, that's what our very society is built on. And the point is, these utopian pagans are, in fact, the only true Christians in the world. Finally, I want to talk about utopian moral theory, and then I think we'll have enough of, of the utopia. The moral philosophy of the utopians is eudaimonistic, which means it's oriented towards happiness. The point of life is to be happy. Their eudaimonism, at least according to Moore, veers towards hedonism, uh, in that they think happiness largely consists in pleasure. Strangely enough, this view is supported by their religion. And they supplement, they feel free to supplement their moral theory with religious um, citation, precisely because they believe reason on its own is insufficient on moral issues. You need the inspiration of the divine. Well, the first religious principle is that we all have an immortal soul, which God made. And God made with the sole purpose of making us happy. Therefore, God punishes, punishes and rewards us in the afterlife for our actions by making us happy if we're good and unhappy if we're bad. Therefore, pleasure is a good thing. Right? And what Moore is commenting on here are the monastic ascetic movements. Wearing hair shirts, flogging yourself, denying yourself food. He says, that's not what God wants. He wouldn't have, you know, he would have given you camel skin if he wanted you to wear that thing. Um, the point is, God wants you to have pleasure and enjoy yourself. Um, therefore, if pleasure is good for us, it's good for everyone. And pleasure is which, uh, my, if my pleasure st stands in the way of your pleasure, therefore it's not a real pleasure. We should never have pleasures at other people's expenses. In fact, Moore argues, selfless pleasure, where I simply try to act in such a way as to give you pleasure, is in fact one of the highest forms of pleasure. 
and, and for several reasons. First of all, such acts of kindness almost always come back. If I do something nice for you, you'll feel beholden and do something nice for me. Secondly, there's a certain internal satisfaction and a sense of fulfillment that comes in right action. And finally, is the contemplation of the eternal reward that I will receive from my Maker for such virtuous action. Thus, happiness is the goal of human endeavor, even a virtuous action. And pleasure, which is their principal species of happiness, is any naturally enjoyable state. Again, the key is that notion of natural, naturally enjoyable, natural state. Um, for instance, gambling is not for them a real pleasure. It's a pleasure because you've been socialized or trained to think it is. It's actually stupid. You're just watching probabilities work themselves out. Um, Wearing fine clothes is not a real pleasure. You're just as comfortable wearing leather with a little wool over it. It's an acculturated pleasure, which is unnatural. It's conventional. Uh, various sorts of emulative things, right? Who can outdress the other? Who can keep up with the Joneses? Those are not real natural pleasures. Those are uh, conventional pleasures, which he thinks are stupid. Um, and, of course, the last example he comes out to... to he mentions of, of conventional pleasures to critique the English society is hunting, right? Which was just the most exciting thing for the English aristocracy. They just love to watch a dog rip, rip a heart, you know, a rabbit's heart out or something like that. He says, yeah, that's fun if you've been brought up with this sort of bizarre bloodlust, but no one naturally likes to see a dog chase a rabbit. You like to see a dog running as a dog, maybe. There's beauty in running, but the blood and gore is not exactly his idea of, of entertainment. Okay, so true natural pleasures, therefore, don't hurt other people, and they have no nasty after effects like pain, right? That's how we know that getting drunk, you think it's a pleasure until the next morning. And that's why Moore says it's not a natural pleasure. Now, there are two sorts of pleasures the utopians recognize, mental and physical. Mental pleasures come from contemplating truth, reading philosophy, thinking over a well-lived life, um, and contemplating one's eternal reward. The mental pleasures are obviously the chief pleasures in life. Secondary or physical pleasures, of which again there are two sort. The first type, type he calls organic release, right, and it just fulfills bodily functions. Eating is a pleasure when you're hungry. Uh, he talks a bit, perhaps scatologically, about excreting. He says if you've had a large meal and you haven't had a chance to relieve yourself, it's actually a great physical pleasure because it's, it's a necessity. Uh, Perhaps surprisingly, he sees uh, sexual release as identical to excreting and scratching and things like that. He says, yeah, these are sorts of pleasures. Once in a while, you have to do it. It's a sort of feverish thing, and it, it's okay. The more profound physical pleasure is simply health itself. It's simply physical well-being, not associated with some sort of uh, irritation or excitation. Okay. Having then given all this moral theory, the whole social structure, the dialogue ends with a wonderful sort of coda by Raphael, bringing home the Christian nature of the utopian society. He says, I've no doubt that either self-interest or the authority of our Savior Christ, who was far too wise not to know what was best for us and far too kind to recommend anything else, would have led the whole world to adopt the utopian communist system long ago if it weren't for that beastly root of all evils pride for pride's criterion of prosperity is not what you've got yourself but what other people haven't got and that I would argue is the enduring third aspect to the Christian religion we've seen the, the father as it were represented in, in Augustine's theology the notion of an imminent logic in the world, or logos in um, Aquinas' doctrine of natural law. It's in more we find, as it were, the third face of God, the third person of the Trinity, the Lamb of God, right? That Christ, that figure which loves humanity and cares for the poor. <laughs>